All right. So for those of you that are just joining, thank you for participating in the 2021 Federal Wearable Summit. Um, this is the stakeholder panel. We'll be discussing the future, um, future of wearables for health monitoring. Um, and we just heard from a federal panel that shared their perspective on some of their current research and use of wearables. But in this panel, we'll be gaining a perspective from some of our stakeholders representing a US government regulatory body and also representing the healthcare quality and payment perspective. Um, and they'll be providing some insight into the use of wearables for health monitoring along the uh, continuum of care for a patient. So I am Kimberly Shredda. I'm a program manager within Barta Drive, and I will be moderating this esteemed panel today. So to get started, I would like to introduce our panel members. Um, first, uh, Dr. Marianne Couch. She's the Senior Vice President of Healthcare Services and Chief Medical Officer within Cambia Health Solutions. And this company administers the region's Blue Cross Blue Shield health insurance plans. She leads medical strategy for all of Cambia and provides executive leadership on medical care initiatives, quality programs, value-based care um, plans, utilization management, pharmacy services and provider relations, network management, payment integrity and cost stewardship. Prior to this role, Dr. Couch, um, was a senior medical advisor in the Office of the Administrator at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, so CMS, and she was involved in policy creation, quality, and promoting the vast expansion of telehealth that was utilized during the, this current pandemic. Dr. Couch was also involved in developing value-based care payment models that we'll probably be addressing a little bit here today, and you can read more about her bio on the Summit website. Our second panelist is Mr. Bakul Patel that you heard mentioned or referenced in the previous session. And he's the Director for Digital Health Center um, for Digital Health at the Center for Excellence at the um, Food and Drug Administration, so the FDA. Um, and he is responsible for providing leadership development, implementation, execution, and management uh, and setting strategic direction and regulatory policy and coordinating the scientific efforts around digital health and emerging technologies. In 2013, he actually coined the term software as a medical device that many of you may be familiar with. And under his, le his leadership, he worked with IMDRF in establishing the globally harmonized definition for software as a medical device and worked with these global regulators to create and author um, the framework, regulatory framework around software as a medical device. And you can also read more on his bio on our summit website as well. So before we get started in the discussion, I just wanted to provide a few slides um, and some perspective and how wearables could be utilized in the future for health monitoring, um, as well as address some of the potential challenges that will probably come up in the discussion today. During our um, my presentation and during the moderated discussion, please feel free to add any questions into the Q&A function, and we'll try to address those periodically throughout um, the next 45 minutes. So within our program within BARTA Drive, we put forth this um, model of this patient care continuum, which is really depicting progression of a patient from initial infection and onset through detectable signs or symptoms of that infection along this potential continuum of increasing severity or consequence from left to right, noting that not every patient progresses in this fashion. There's no intent to really um, display scale here in terms of time and an individual patient's path along this continuum can obviously vary. The nodes in red are supposed to represent potential um, time points of events that um, could lead to um, potential use of interventions and mitigation of progression along the continuum. T equals zero represents the, the start or that discernible um, detection of signs or symptoms. And so if you can envision to the left of that, the patient could be healthy, progress to being infected, remain pre-symptomatic um, before symptoms are detectable or potentially stay in an asymptomatic state. To the right of this, the patient may progress to various degrees of severity. The purple represents disease heterogeneity, and this may complicate um, recognition of illness severity, but it also, this, this purple should also reflect the patient heterogeneity that may be detected as well due to the pathogen involved in the illness. Um, and also the patient individual heterogeneity that may be further complicated by um, comorbidities. So why is this relevant to the discussion today? 
Um, so these red nodes, as I mentioned, may not only represent time points of events during this progression of illness, but they could also potentially represent opportunities for intervention. So typically when we think of health monitoring, we often think of the sick patient, right? How do we take care of this individual sick? How do we know um, um, how we should intervene to improve outcomes? And so wearables could potentially be used in, in, in along this part of this continuum to empower both the patients, um, so when they're at home recovering from illness, as well as healthcare providers and remote monitoring to provide information on the current health status. And this you can envision could help and aid in making decisions on care for that patient. But there is a balance um, and wearables today have really penetrated this market in terms of general health and wellness. And so we need to consider that also when we're thinking about health monitoring and disease progression as well. And so if we start to balance this, this monitoring of the sick with the monitoring of the healthy, we may empower individuals to um, stay healthier longer because you'll, um, you'll identify early signs of illness. And this could also play a role in making healthcare more accessible for individuals. But where we may have a missed opportunity is really in this recovery space um, when patients are recovering from illness or being discharged from a hospital and wearables could play a role in really helping to, to identify um, deterioration of health of that patient or sequelae of disease, obviously like what we're seeing um, with COVID-19. So there are several opportunities that you can envision for the use of wearables and many of these will be paired with um, digital health components, as you can imagine, many may be um, based on algorithm type components. So wearables may be able to be used for identifying um, signs of infection or determining a person, an individual's uh, risk of becoming infected. It may, they may be able to predict severe outcomes that may arise due to that infection. They may um, be utilized to inform on further workup of a patient, so further diagnostic or, or um, clinical laboratory approaches that are needed. They could aid in that clinical decision making, making. They could potentially be used for triaging patient care, so discerning when a patient may need to go to the hospital and need that escalated care. They could potentially be used in monitoring a patient who is sick and, and aid in determining if that treatment plan or patient management plan is working or, or help target a specific treatment or management plan. They could be used in this, this um, recovery space as well um, in the discharge from the hospital to, to follow patients for further health deterioration. They could be used in, in clinical trials to monitoring um, patient safety. And they could also potentially be utilized in, in patient stratification that could support care of those patients. But with all these potential opportunities come challenges as well. So we have to take into consideration these factors with the development of these types of devices. So this is just to name a few and, and many of these may come up in the conversation today as well. So obviously the device specifications for a given indication have to be taken into consideration. The performance within a diverse patient population, the clinical setting where this will be used, whether it's at home, pre-hospital or in the hospital, how reimbursement will be addressed, especially when we're monitoring outside the hospital or monitoring healthy individuals, the novel regulatory paths that may be needed um, with these tools, and the size of the data sets that may be needed um, to both train and validate the performance of algorithms that could be paired with these tools, as well as assess the accuracy of the devices. So with that, I am going to stop sharing these slides and move over to the discussion with our panelists. So welcome. So Dr. Couch and Mr. Patel, thank you for joining us today and participating in this panel. So why don't we kick off with our first question. Where do you see wearable technologies playing the greatest role in health monitoring? I'll start with Mr. Patel. Thank you, Kim. Actually, your presentation was really, really nicely put put forward and I think you laid the foundation towards where it's actually gonna be really helpful. Um, I, I feel, I, I'm seeing a lot of investment happening in the space where consumer technologies, especially when you think about the concept of variables and, and today I think we are just thinking about a concept of variables on your skin or your, as a patch or on your wrist. But I think you, know, you can imagine this uh, even going further than that, basically it's really something on the body. 
that can be taken with you with you all the time. And as we start thinking about technology be getting miniaturized, uh, we are seeing a lot of those things sort of coming to fruition. In healthcare, like you sort of laid out, I think the divide between when do we label somebody as a patient versus not, uh, or before that is going to, is something where wearables are providing insights that it's almost giving us a runway into the healthcare system to understand where the patient has been before they become a patient. So that's like the first, the front end, which you kind of laid out really nicely about healthy individuals or individuals before we even say healthy or unhealthy, um, showing symptomatic changes into their, into, their, into their physiology can be identified with some of those. Uh, and then on the back end, after care or acute care has been given, uh, there's lots of work I'm seeing being done in understanding um, sort of the therapeutic sort of um, effects on a patient, either from a physical functions perspective or a mental health perspective, or just coaching people through that. Um, those aspects are sort of coming into play. I'm also seeing uh, not just the diagnostics and prevention, but also therapeutics interventions from con uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, physical therapy, and other therapies that doesn't necessarily have to be a drug or biologics uh, or an intervention of any kind, but also suggestions and making sure people are following through and being compliant with their therapeutic goals is sort of happening in that space. I want to I pause here and just say that it doesn't come free of all sort of potential risk and some potential cautions we need to think about. Um, it, measuring something really finite in one domain without actually giving context to where that information came from is something that we have to be cognizant of as we start moving forward and, and embracing some of those technologies. That's going to be really, really helpful, but leveraging them instead of actually being really cautious about it is also another way to think about it. Thank you. And Dr. Couch, maybe you could elaborate on that or expand where you think the greatest value of these tools lie, especially from a payment perspective. Sure. And uh, Bakul and Kimberly, it's great to see you again. And I was thinking that you guys are the good cops and I get to be the bad cop and talk about sort of how we think about reimbursing. So because I work for a, a commercial health plan, a payer, I thought maybe I'd start there and then I can talk a little bit about what happened when I was in the office of the administrator at CMS in terms of how um, these wearables and, and a part of that is remote patient monitoring, which is sort of the area we're most interested in. But um, I, I was thinking about it, and there's sort of two ways that I see wearables, especially remote patient monitoring, really changing it. And one is, um, as we think about an increased emphasis on wellness, uh, large employer groups are coming to us, and they want, as part of their uh, request for proposal, when they think about what health plan they're going to go with, what are you doing to keep our members well? And so if you think about wearables in terms of being able to track biometric data and help that member have uh, plans, even self-serve plans that you can offer digitally to keep them well, that that's going to be something that's very attractive to us as a payer. And that's passive data monitoring. Um, and it, it's not something, the data from that isn't something that has to be tied into a health system necessarily. You could conceive that you would bring that data forward to your primary care clinician in your health ecosystem, um, but you don't have to. It's something that um, members and patients can use to keep well. And so we, we find that attractive. When, when you also think about wearables, about keeping really chronically ill patients healthier and out of hospitals and, and um, safer, um, then all of a sudden it's a little bit tougher for us. We have, I would think, um, a value chain that we look at. And the first part of that value chain, when you're talking about high acuity patients, high, high acuity members that have real significant problems, you have to think about, okay, great data acquisition. You have to think about connectivity, how you're going to connect that data. The third is how you're going to integrate that into a clinical workflow or triage that data and triage that member when they need to be steered to the right uh, site of care. And then finally, 
program optimization, how you're going to make sure that that, that data is received in a, 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 a workflow by the provider and part of a care management program. And so for a payer, if you talk about high acuity members or high acuity, more serious illnesses, if you just have the device, a great device, and you have data acquisition and connectivity, you don't have the other part of the food chain that the or the value chain rather for us it's food chain but value chain um, with um, triage of that information and then wrapping it around a great clinical care program we we can't we can't find a lot of value in that in terms of um, a payer and if that doesn't happen you probably can't link it to reduce hospital admissions um, reduced unnecessary ER visits, those types of things. So, so that's how we think about it in the payer world. And then when I was at CMS, um, we, as you know, and I'll just, I, if you've been watching this, I'm sure you got this in, in spades, but, um, but Cool's agency, FDA, looks at safe and effective. And all of a sudden when it comes over to CMS, we look at necessary and reasonable. And that, that, those are sometimes two different things. And so we're gonna wanna know that you've tested your devices, your wearables out in our populations that we look at, which are disabled and um, elderly. And we're gonna wanna, again, also know that it's going to have outcomes that we can track as well. So um, those are two sort of high level views from the payer and then from you know at sitting in on national coverage decisions at CMS. So if, if you don't mind, maybe we can expand on one of the, the points you made, the first point about um, wanting to keep patients held and this increase in wellness. Is there a perspective on this of using a, a regulated device, so a medical device versus more of a wellness type device in, in that setting? So it depends. Um, you can build programs around either one of those. And it, it's really, um, I think it ought to be part of a, uh, as um, a payer, it ought to be part of a comprehensive program. I've got wellness, self-help, and then I've got, it ties in uh, to the sort of mild disease on up. Um, but it depends. You, you can go either way. It's just um, important that you, in my mind, that you, it's part of a comprehensive program that we've thought about carefully as a payer. All right, thank you. So I think this is all important to consider. So it's not just um, the engineering of the device itself, but we also have to think about that long-term utility and implementation and the, the, the value-based care and reimbursement that may be wrapped around that as well. So I think we've painted a picture of where there could be a future for, for use of decent health monitoring, but um, let's look, maybe expand a little bit more into some of the barriers that may exist for implementation or the challenges um, related to adoption of these tools. And Mary, maybe you can provide some additional insight into how these um, wearables may be able to address um, health disparities gaps um, or how access to care may, may affect this. Uh for me, I get really excited when I think about how it might help expand um, a, a member uh, relationship with a high quality clinician in underserved uh, communities and being able to extend the reach um, beyond mostly urban settings sometimes. So for health equity, this is really exciting for me. The, the key thing is that you, um, again, wrap the wearable around an excellent member, physician, or clinician relationship. And then, um, again, if you have that value chain, if it's a high acuity problem, uh, that member could live hours away. And then you would have the ability, because you've addressed data acquisition, connectivity, workflow, somebody's watching that, and then you have the ability to um, have a peer management program where someone is calling that member in, you, you can see how this, I, you can see how a member could live four or five hours away. And, and as part of a, a, a care team, then they were able to reach and stay in touch with that member and they're not having to travel that whole time. So that's a simple example of someone with congestive heart failure, for instance, or, or some of these more common chronic conditions where you could really move move the needle in healthcare with, with these types of devices. Um, if someone's discharged from home, I know you're interested, Kimberly, in sepsis. 
if someone's in, discharged from a hospital from a, a cardiac procedure and uh, they had a catheter in their bladder, uh, you could, you know, conceivably you could see how you'd put a monitor on them so that you could watch that their blood pressure is dropping and their heart rate's going up. Uh, you know, that really isn't done yet, but I can see a world where then you can have line of sight on your members um, as they go home to great distances. And these are the types of things that help us with health equity and help us reach underserved communities. Thank you, very, very insightful. Um, Bakul, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I was, I was just reflecting on what Marian just talked about and I, I thought it was really interesting to start thinking about high acuity and the spectrum, um, which is really fascinating. And I also get really excited about wearables being becoming, actually wearables are consumer technology that are becoming so affordable that we can reach those people that we never used to reach. Uh, so either it's distance or it's economic situation or social or, or even sort of in remoteness of, of, the, of the country we live in. I feel like that's sort of one advantage. I also think uh, we have to get better at starting, think, starting to think about how much invasive are we going to be into the what we consider privacy is of today. And we start thinking about following somebody, uh, following their hand movements or following their motions and following their temperature is one thing. And it's pretty soon sort of just like the patient is patient and non-patients or a healthy patient, healthy person and patient's lines are being blurred. I feel like that blurriness about health data versus non-health data that's inferred to have health implications is something that we'll have to figure out and uh, how do you sort of think about it from that perspective. I think somebody in care, it's really easy to think about convincing them and saying, you know, we're gonna monitor and follow you for the next amount of time. But somebody who is being monitored for activity, especially if you think about, you know, aging population. And when you talk about aging population um, and if they're aging in place, and if you have wearables that detect their mobility in their in their in their in place location, I think you're you're getting at the very close to the line of what we consider you know intrusion of some kind, and I think that's where we'll have to that's the social part that we'll have to figure out, and then ec economic part will sort of follow after that, right? So I think when Marion talks about reimbursement or payment, I think the economic factor about what would people do to sort of give that insight so there is actually a value to be seen by having this technology provided to people who may not actually be called patients at this time. Well, cool, I, I think that's a huge issue and I'm so glad you raised it. I've always found, and Kimberly didn't say, um, but I practiced medicine for 30 years and you know, really complex patients. And, and if a clinician asks you to use one of these, you're probably gonna say yes, but a payer or the government, yeah. It, 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 that trust issue and, and making sure you live up to that trust of their private data is huge. So it, it, it's a great thing you raised. So maybe both of you could also speak a little bit to um, the use of these devices during the pandemic, because many of these issues obviously are true for um, what we're seeing within our country with um, COVID-19 and the disparities and the need for access to care with all individuals. So are there any lessons learned or is there any sort of um, insights gained from, from seeing these, these technologies implemented right now? Maybe I'll pick it off and I'll, from what I've seen, you know, because there was a push from the administration to increase telemedicine, I think that was like one of the biggest push in sort of where digital health sort of be is becoming sort of the norm, just like we are doing remote conferences today. But I think the next wave is going to be uh, remote monitoring, like Marion just talked about. It's it's just it's beyond just seeing a patient. It's more about understanding the physiology of the patient. I feel like that wave is here. We've seen so many products that come to FTA that have been talking about miniaturizing vital signs monitoring and giving putting it on on a patient's wrist or a sticky pad or something that can go on their chest or other places uh, and being able to remotely do that, I think, at, and, and serve that and having, um, and if you want to take a, <laughs> take a tangent towards the technology, sort of how technology sort of serve people 
by updating their software, I think there is probably a, a place we will get to where providers will now provide updates to their dosage for, for patients who are being, uh, being instrumented with insulin pumps that can be remotely monitored because you're not relying on the patient. You're now getting in touch with, with the patient at, so, at a such high touch, uh, frequency that you can actually make those care decisions when you didn't have and you didn't have to wait for the three-month visit. So I feel like that's where the direction is heading. And I'm already seeing people investing, people making, people getting products authorized for FTA and so on. So cool, I couldn't agree more. I think I've never seen an era of transformation like the one I'm seeing now. And if, if there's a silver lining to this awful pandemic, that's it. And I, I do think everyone is embracing change uh, and thinking about how to keep people out of hospitals. It, it's huge. I mean, from the fact that when you now go to see your provider or go to the hospital, you're at risk for getting infected, to the fact that they're overrun, to the fact that we now are um, entire large commercial payers have staked out their strategic plan around hospital at home, hospital in a home, keeping people out of hospitals. It, it's really a remarkable time. And I think it's great. I agree with you. Um, for me, if, if you can think about ways to safely have a patient after an acute episode, not go spend a month in a skilled nursing home, but go home in a way that again, supports the health system, safely monitoring them. I mean, that that's a huge win for everybody. So I, I do think there's a receptivity to it. Commercial payers see it. Um, we see it, um, and I, I think it'll change the it'll change the landscape in a big way. Um, and the wearables slash remote patient monitoring are are the reason why. The reason why. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, the benefits of remote monitoring during the pandemic. I think we can all probably say we've had virtual visits with our providers and. Um, if we had that additional data to support those visits, we probably could have gained more value out of that, that interaction. But just reducing that face-to-face -face time or exposure to other um, infections going into a clinical care setting also can be of benefit. But I think the value of just being able to monitor more patients at once um, is pretty incredible. So we're at a point where I wanted to pause um, and look at some of the questions. We, they've been pouring into the Q&A. So um, but cool, let's start with one for you. And this is around um, clinical decision support guidance that the agency has issued. And if you could explain or provide insight really where a tool crosses that line into a medical device and when it would need to be regulated. Yeah, I'll probably touch on very high levels for the intentions of the guidance um, without getting to it. So first of all, it's a draft guidance. We are, we got a bunch of comments and we're revising it uh, as we speak. But the guidance really is reflective of what Congress told us, like what would not be a device if it was a clinical decision support of some kind. And, the, and Congress basically put in law that if a healthcare provider is not going to primar primarily rely on a recommendation made by software, but and and not to make make some make choices for diagnosing or treating, um, then those kind of support tools would be non medical devices. And I think this guidance talks about when those lines are crossed and when those lines are important to sort of consider. I'm just overly simplifying sort of the guidance, which is about 30 pages long, um, in two sentences, but. I would say I think the concept there was, you know, how do you allow, how do you draw the line when a computer-aided diagnostics, which is also a software solution that is giving people, giving healthcare providers, a, here's a lesion, go look at it, which have, we have been regulated for a very long time, to giving them support towards, hey, hey doc, please don't enter this value. It's so far out of range. You should not be even think, and just alerting them. Uh, or even uh, reminding of reminding them in a hospital setting that oh you somebody else has already prescribed X amount of that particular medications that can be reconciled. So when when tools like on that other end of the spectrum where we would say are becoming part of the workflow that helps and augments care that's happening in routine life that that you know it will be helpful for people. I think that was the intention from Congress to let us tell us that. There are not devices. They should be not be regulated. And then 
of course, when they when products and software that are going to be used in in actually getting a clinician to make a diagnosis or a treatment or prevention action would be something that we would regulate. So that's really what the guidance is talking about. Could you point um, those joining into the, the meeting today where they can go for further information or if they have questions, they can email um, or what is the process for engaging with the FDA to gain clarity on their specific device? Oh, absolutely. I, we um, So my group actually does this on a routine basis. Um, people can write to digitalhealth.fda.hhs.gov. Um, and, and sometimes we get questions about, uh, this is my product, I'm thinking about doing this. Is Do you have a policy on it? And it doesn't have to be say, a clinical decision support, it could be anything people are trying to determine. And sometimes they're so early that we tell them like, yes, if you do this, you may be considered as a regulator. If you if you do that, you may not be considered a regulator because our policy state, if you're just addressing general health and wellness, you're not sort of diverting people to cause an un, you know, unintended harm, then I think that would be something that we'd be okay with. So we, we have policies that we have laid out. We guide people through that. So that's step number one. And there we have questions that come to us when I talk about oh, I'm actually making a medical device. It is considered as a medical device. What do I do next? Can I have a conversation with FTA? I think we also help people connecting with the right review branches within, within FTA to talk through specific, specific sort of uh, expectations of what would be required, what should be required for where that study should be or where, where what should be included in a submission when they're ready for it. So we provide those services, in fact, if you, you may have heard about the Q, Q submission program, which is pre-submission program, um, the digital health email box I just mentioned, there all are tools and resources you can probably reach out to and sort of help, have a conversation. Um, there are some self-help tools as well. Our website has been revamped to sort of talk about these guidances, especially in the space in one spot, so you can take a look at that. Uh, we're probably also looking at making tools available for people in the future where the, you know, people can sort of do more self-help. Um, so more to come, but that's where you can start today. Thank you. I'm sure that was very helpful for everybody listening. Um, so a question that came in sort of relates to one of the additional questions I wanted to ask um, Marianne, and that's regarding the role of different organizations in terms of reimbursement and affordability and access to care. And so the question was around, um, if there's no coverage for the cost of a device and you're trying to get these devices to patients who need them, it could have the potential to increase health disparities among these patients who can't afford the devices, especially with home monitoring. So how do we address this? So that's a question in the chat, but it ties into this larger conversation about what role do all these organizations, the payers, industry, the government have in addressing this. So Marianne, hopefully you can provide, shed some light on this for us. Yeah, and um, I wanna make sure I'm listening to the question. It, it, it's how do members or patients afford the devices? And the, the good news is we often, especially when we're thinking about using them for um, severe uh, or high acuity um, patients with, with severe diseases or multiple diseases, we think it's so important by the time it's got to that point that we supply the member with it. We'll, we'll, we'll send them out. You know, um, I'll give a couple examples of how this works to help people who are innovators think about it. We actually mail out, and it's not a wearable, but we'll mail out um, blood pressure cuffs to certain members because they can take their blood pressure and they can then uh, talk about that reading with their healthcare provider because it closes a care gap. So we have um, uh, star measures that um, CMS drives as a health plan. And we wanna be really good at that. And so their HEDIS measures, which is you know just a term, but if, if you look it up, it's capital H-E-D-I-S. And those are so important for us that we'll give the members these um, devices. And so again, that's remote patient monitoring, not so much wearables, but you could see how wearables would fit in because it closes a care gap. So if innovators are really savvy, they'll figure out what 
care gaps both government programs and then commercial payers want to close and how their device might fit into that because we will willingly give it to the member. The second thing is if we have a set of members, um, say we um, have a million members and we know that um, 15% of them drive 50% of our costs, we might, we would, we would devise care management programs where you send out things to those members to help them stay healthier, help them stay out of the hospital, out of the emergency department, know when to go to see their doctor, know when to go to the emergency department at the right time. Um, and those things drive down our costs. So that that's sort of a sweet spot for the entrepreneurs to think about. Um, I'll tell you, I'll share a story just because it's a real one and, and it ties into um, uh, a comment made at the last panel about the importance of wearables for maternal care. I could not agree more, but here's the issue with some of that. There was a company, and I'm going to keep it broad so you can't tell what I'm talking about, that wanted us to have a national coverage decision about um, a wearable that would help a condition in pregnancy. Um, and it's a, it's a real condition. The problem is there's not a lot of things you can do about it. Therefore, we wouldn't consider covering it because there's no outcome associated with it. However, when you think about value-based care arrangements where we're paying the, the providers to have a good outcome, I could see how if we paid a health, uh, um, a health system or a provider group X a number of dollars to make sure that all their members got through that episode of care maternity with an excellent outcome, they might want to know that data. That would help them keep members safer, better, know when to call them in. So in a value-based world where we're talking about paying for an episode of care, we don't we don't care how you keep members safe and you can innovate around that. That device would work, but because we couldn't tie it to an exact outcome at CMS, as an example, we would not cover it. Um, it just it just didn't fit the, the it wasn't necessary or reasonable um, without an outcome associated with it. So I think value-based care will allow us to think more broadly about the type of information we'd want because the providers can innovate about how they would receive it and use that information, which is more, not as rigid as what we have as a payer, both at CMS and, and as a commercial payer. So who, who sort of leads um, that value-based care? Is that the government or um, payers like yourself, or what do you see this distinction in, in the roles there? Yeah, so um, the best world, my nirvana, is that it's multi-payer. Um, there's the Innovation Center, led by Elizabeth Fowler now, who um, designs payment models, and they're very interested in health equity and value-based care. And so they're going to be driving them for the um, Medicare population, and then states can pick them up for Medicaid. Uh, as a commercial pair, we want to align with that. We want to make sure that we're trying to build value-based care because we want better outcomes for, you know, higher quality, lower cost as well. So we design value-based payment models as well. And if we can align the two and have multi-payer, then we, I think you, that world will really be ripe for these innovations because then you, the, the, providers can figure out what kind of information they want. And it, it, if they think it's providing value to them, then, then they can um, adopt it and, and uh, give it to their members. All right, thank you. A another sort of piece of this too is the clinician acceptance as well. So we talked a little bit about payment um, to support utility of these devices, but in terms of clinician acceptance with the additional resources that may be needed to monitor the data coming off of these devices and integrating into workflow, do you have any insight on that piece of how we can, um, what would be needed to affect or change those decisions for use? Well, cool. Maybe I'll take that one and, and pitch it over to you afterwards to keep me honest. But again, that, that is an issue. Um, if you're, you have to have alignment, payment alignment and um, alignment with your goals. Um, you, again, there's a value chain for this. And if you just do the um, data acquisition and connectivity and just dump data to the provider, it won't work. You're going to have to properly triage and then have someone integrated into a care management program. So it, it, it really must be a, a well curated signal that um, it follows evidence-based guidelines that you then give to your care management team and your clinician. Without that, 
you're, you're, you're going to get very low adoption by providers. If you do it well, I would imagine, I, um, and then you have a payment model that matches it, again, either a value-based bundle arrangement where they're paid appropriately for getting that member through an episode of care, or they have a total cost of care value, um, value um, based arrangement, um, you're aiding the provider and then you'll get high adoption as well. But again, you, you've got to give highly curated evidence-based um, data to the provider because they're, they're incredibly busy and that, that's only gonna get worse after the pandemic. Yeah, I would just add to that, Marianne. I think uh, you're absolutely right. In order for, I think at the end of the day, if I were to sum it up, I would say everybody's looking for better outcomes. And if you if you just across the spectrum, right? I think the makers of these technologies, people who are bringing insights from data, so it's just providing raw data is going to be the first step, which is where most people are going, and expecting, you know, peers and regulators to sort of see, a, or even providers for that matter, in in practice to sort of see a value out of just seeing more information, is going to be less uh, less helpful. I think where the value, and this is kind of what we've been sort of seeing, seeing as well, is like, even though there's a lot of work being done in cure, generating data and curating it into something visually appealing, but really the insights and the importance comes when you start really trying to get to more and more towards a diagnostics. You, if you're making the life of a clinician easier by, and I would just make an analogy to a glucose meter. If every every clinician today took a sample and created their own reagent and an analyte and try to figure it out every time a patient shows up, shows up without a medical device like we call glucose meter, we would not be here, right? So I think if you just replace all of that, that chemistry and, and technology with data, you're at that analyte and reagent phase. We need to get to that next level where converting all that information into a simplistic one single number, which actually can tell you something about something about the patient, whether the disease or condition or trend or something. And that's really where we need to get to. Um, I think the part B of this, uh, this scenario is going to be, and it, this is where it's heading already. I'm seeing it in, in medical schools already happening is people who are getting trained are getting trained to sort of look at um, insights from looking at data trends with at higher fidelity. And I think that's what's gonna come to a center where in the middle where people will be like, okay, I can look at more data, not just one number, but I will need tools to help me get into those insights where I can see better and how I'm doing in relation to my other patients with similar sort of situation. So I, we are not there yet. I think we're getting there and I think that's an opportunity. Well, thank you both. Um, we are near the bottom of the hour. That time flew by. So I appreciate um, both of your, your time and your, your valuable insight into this discussion. Um, just to wrap up, um, just to leave everybody with some parting words, if you could sort of suspend reality um, and say in a couple sentences what you really see as the future for health monitoring um, beyond what is really kind of possible today. Um, and the value of that, and then what do we need to get there? I'll start with uh, Marianne. You know, you can see how this would extend the range of uh, a clinician to have members in uh, broader distances and in distant sites. And you can see how it would help it expand access and then also um, the, the workforce issue that we have. So it, there's just so many things that can be done with this. So, so I, I'm very excited about it. And again, I look through it as extending range site access um, um, and, and couldn't be more um, optimistic about the future. I would, uh, I would say the same. I think I'm really optimistic in the way where we're heading. I think the promise of earlier detection and to change the course of a disease or a condition that, that requires large payments at the, at the very end of the acuity spectrum. And to me, that is much more uh, sort of desirable as we start getting into uh, you know, things like we know we can delay. Um, things that we know we can avoid or prevent when it's before it actually shows up in symptomatic way of some kind. 
I think that's where some of these insights are going to be really, really helpful. But we, I, I'm going to say a but, because a but has to come with evidence, a but has to come with science, with a but has to come with, you know, adoption and acceptance and trust in that insights and has to be repeated, right? We can't just think about, you know, we have one fidelity or high fidelity data of steps, but doesn't doesn't provide the context of what does that really mean for that person or what does that mean for that disease? I think that's where it's going to be important for us to get to. Uh, so will it happen? Yes. Will we reduce cost in what we do today? Absolutely. Um, that's where I think we are, we're going to get to is that early detection, early identification, so we could change the course of a disease or condition way before we we try to do it with something very, very high acuity. Well, thank you both. I, I think you helped put some goalposts in the ground and we all can play a role in, in helping move this technology forward and implementing its use.